prepared. The American independence movements were Creole revolutions formed and led by the descendants of European settlers born in the New World. And I argued that the political theorists that defined and defended Creole revolutions throughout the hemisphere were, first to, were forced to confront a, a distinctive political and philosophical dilemma, and that as a result, their ideas and their institutions, the institutions they created were marked by a distinctive contradiction. They were both anti-imperial and imperial at the same time. And that interpretation of these ideas has some implications, I think, that extend beyond the uh, ideas of the American independence movements, implications that can help us rethink established accounts of the America's longer term political development uh, and patterns of inter-American relations, uh, as I'll try to describe by the end of my talk. Um, but I hope to start uh, by looking at some maps. Felipe, if you would, slide. There we go, good. So these two maps uh, tell the story of the America's independence uh, that we all know. On the left, we have the boundaries of the major imperial powers claims at the midpoint of the 18th century, with Britain in red, France in green, Spain in yellow, and Portugal in violet. Uh, now, we have to treat the map with a little bit of skepticism, not only because I'm a poor cartographer, uh, and a worse artist, uh, but also because the claims that they are represented there were intensely contested. Uh, the great powers disagreed at times violently uh, with each other about the borders of their American possessions. Uh, metropolitan governments and colonial administrators also struggled constantly to control the inhabitants of the, of the lands they claimed to rule and really only achieved a very partial success. Uh, de facto, France controlled few of the indigenous communities within the North American territories that it claimed. Uh, Spain had only the sparsest organization of missionaries and frontier garrisons in the North American West, in the eastern plains of Venezuela, and the southern cone. Uh, and Portugal had barely even explored much of the Brazilian uh, interior. Uh, even within areas where European sovereignty was well established, enslaved African and indigenous laborers frequently engaged in both small and large scale rebellion uh, in the North American South, in the Caribbean, in the Andean Highlands. Uh, but in the 50 years surrounding the turn of the 19th century, European rule of the New World was not just contested, uh, but in many places definitively and finally overthrown, uh, clearing the way for the establishment of independent states. And by 1850, the Americas had taken on roughly the shape that they retain today. So on this map on the right, uh, Britain is still in Canada in its Caribbean holdings and a slice of the Guyanas. Uh, Spain retains Cuba and Puerto Rico. Portugal still holds Brazil. But elsewhere, sovereignty has shifted to new entities, uh, to the United States, to Mexico, Peru, Argentina, so on. Uh, all right, so that's the standard account of American independence uh, slide. Now, this map uh, will look much less familiar uh, because it tells a very different story about the American independence movements. Uh, here I've shaded the original territorial claims made by four polities that prosecuted and won wars of independence in the Americas. In blue, uh, of course, is the United States, which during its revolution managed to win concessions to a territory somewhat larger than the original 13 colonies, but which was born a relatively small state, hemmed in by Britain, France, and Spain's remaining North American possessions. Uh, meanwhile, in brown, we have what was known as the Empire of Mexico, which became independent of Spanish rule in 1821 and claimed at that time not only present-day Mexico, but most of the North American West and all of Central America. In pink are the territories liberated between 1819 and 1826 by the Patriot Armies of Simón Bolívar, who sought to establish a single federal state in Andean South America, encompassing all of present-day Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, Peru, uh, Ecuador, and Bolivia. Uh, and, and finally, in Teal, we have the United Provinces of the Rio de la Plata, uh, founded by the May Revolution of 1810, and claiming at that time all of present-day Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Bolivia from its capital in Buenos Aires. What I want to suggest is that this map reveals an important and under-recognized point of convergence in the political ideas of the American, British American, and Spanish American independence movements. Uh, 
So it wasn't only the founders of the United States that envisioned their future on a continental scale. These famously expansive ambitions had analogies throughout the Americas, embodied in independent states with territories as large as those of the empires they had replaced. But when we consider this map, we're confronted by a critical juncture in the America's political development, one that retrospect makes it easy to overlook. In this moment, it was not yet inevitable that the United States would become the world's largest economy and preeminent military superpower. It was not yet inevitable that as 18 separate states, uh, Spanish America would experience persistent political instability, uneven economic development, and frequent foreign interventions over the course of the 19th century. So when we recognize that in the immediate aftermath of independence, British Americans and Spanish Americans had similar aspirations, confronted similar problems, built similar institutions, we're challenged to rethink this still very common perception that the United States is and has always been an exceptional nation. Uh, and we're forced to reconsider the causes of the disparities of wealth and power that divide the Americans today. Uh, but in order to really understand this map, what we need is a comparative study of the political ideas that it depicts, one that identifies the shared features of the context within which the American independence movements arose and thus accounts for their shared ideologies. And that's what I attempt to provide in, in my book. Now, given their geographic and temporal proximity, uh, it, it is somewhat surprising that there aren't already lots of studies out there that compare the ideas of the American independence movements. Uh, I, when I started this project, uh, to my mind, the Americas formed a fairly natural set of comparative foils for one another. Uh, but when I began reading uh, in the literature, uh, looking in particular for comparative work, what I found is that it's actually been much more common uh, to, for scholars to compare the North American, uh, the British American, and the Spanish American independence movements to two separate sets of non-American uh, revolutions uh, rather than comparing them to each other. Uh, slide, please. So you can think here about two uh, broad paradigms or uh, interpretive frameworks that have guided most of the comparative work uh, that there is on the ideas of the American independence movements. Uh, the first, uh, probably more prominent, in the, at least in the English-speaking uh, uh, scholarship, is what's known as the Age of Revolutions thesis. Uh, here, uh, the independence movement of the United States is treated as part of a wave of political contention, which rises first in England's glorious revolution, gains strength in North America, and crests in revolutionary France uh, before crashing over the rest of the Atlantic world. Um, like other signal events in the Age of Revolutions, in this account, the British North American independence movement was inspired by Enlightenment philosophies uh, and contributed to an epochal transition in world history, hastening the demise of feudalism, the monarchies of the Ancien Regime, and clearing the way for the rise of capitalism and modern liberal democracy. Uh, and though they occurred at around the same time, the Spanish-American independence movements have rarely been considered important events in the age of revolutions. Instead, they've been viewed as expressions of an early uh, or incipient nationalism, uh, a sense of separate American identity, which formed gradually over the course of the colonial period and crystallized in the first decades of the 19th century. So according to this view, Spanish Americans came to think of themselves as Peruvians or as Chileans, uh, for example, rather than as Spaniards. And then they sought independence in order to bring political sovereignty into alignment with their new national identities. Uh, now, that interpretation has not generally led to comparative studies at all. Uh, it's, it's led to a literature that is by and large organized according to contemporary national boundaries. Uh, but when it has inspired comparisons, it's pointed scholars to a different set of cases, positioning Spanish American independence movements as early forerunners of anti-colonial struggles in Asia and Africa. So the idea here is that shaking off this oppressive yoke of colonial rule, Spanish Americans created a model of national liberation that subsequent freedom fighters would follow. Uh, in the process, they confronted difficulties in consolidating their independence that would arise again and again in post-colonial societies around the world, uh, and which have not generally been thought to have afflicted the United States. Uh, so 
As I said, the dominance of these two frameworks has led scholars away from comparing the American independence movements to each other. Uh, but this isn't their only defect. Both also fail to explain important features of these movements' political thought, and both lead us to problematic conceptions of the societies that these movements produced. Uh, so the analogies drawn by the Age of Revolutions thesis elide an important distinction between anti-monarchism and anti-imperialism. Uh, this makes it very difficult to account for patriotic Americans' loyalty to their monarch, uh, which persisted even in the late stages of their disenchantment with empire, uh, or their continued attraction to quasi-monarchical institutions, like the presidency, as I'm going to talk about in a moment, after independence had been won. Uh, the Age of Revolutions thesis also tends to pass over the peculiar institutions present in British North America uh, and, in, and in Portuguese and Spanish South America, uh, but absent in Europe at the end of the 18th century. So reducing the important roles that African slavery and the colonization of indigenous lands played in the ideology of the American independence movement and in the political struggles of the early American Republic. Meanwhile, the incipient nationalism thesis implies incorrectly that prior to their independence movements, Spanish Americans had already adopted national identities corresponding to the states that the civil wars of the 19th century would eventually produce. Uh, as a result, it cannot explain the differences between the, reasons, the region's present day political boundaries and the independent states that Spanish American patriots originally envisioned. In particular, it passes over these important, though unsuccessful, efforts that Spanish Americans, like their North American counterparts, made to unify former colonies under common governments after winning independence. Uh, the incipient nationalism thesis, I think, also exaggerates the extent to which the leaders of the Spanish American independence movements rejected their own European identities in favor of nationalist alternatives that incorporated African and indigenous Americans on equal terms. Uh, as this thesis assumes, again, incorrectly, that the valorization of racial mixing uh, that emerged later in Spanish-American political thought preceded or accompanied the region's independence. Uh, so if the Age of Revolutions thesis really neglects, ignores, tries to reduce the American independence movement's distinctively imperial context, the incipient nationalism thesis really mischaracterizes that context. Uh, in the Americas, uh, independence was demanded and won, by and large, not by conquered indigenous populations, but by the descendants of the conquerors themselves. Uh, and the fact that this colonial elite, known in Spanish as criollos, in English as creoles, is that word used in Brazil as well? Criollos? Yeah. Uh, uh, not really common, less, but you can not, find not it. Not as common. Okay, okay. Uh, 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 critically distinguishes them from both contemporaneous European revolutions and from later Asian and African anti-colonial struggles. Um, slide. So uh, to see what I mean, uh, consider this quote from Simon Bolivar's famous Jamaica letter of 1815. Uh, today, Bolivar is probably the single most iconic leader of uh, Spanish America's struggle for independence. Uh, but the, his road to eternal fame and glory was rocky. Uh, and in the course of explaining the difficulties that an early and unsuccessful revolt had faced, he wrote of himself and his compatriots, we are neither Indians nor Europeans, but a species midway between the legitimate owners of the land and the Spanish usurpers. Being Americans by birth and Europeans by right, we must both dispute the claims of natives and resist external invasion. Thus, we find ourselves in the most extraordinary and complicated situation. So here, Bolivar captures very succinctly the features of the American independence movements that I think are lost to the dominant frameworks I've just discussed. As Europeans by right, Creoles enjoyed a privileged position within the American colonies, benefiting from the coerced labor of indigenous and African Americans and from exclusive access to institutions of higher education, trade groups, and other governmental and civil society organizations. But as Americans by birth, Creoles were marginalized to varying degrees by their European-born peers. They had to watch as administrative posts within their own colonies were filled by fresh arrivals from Europe. They had to contend with commercial policies designed to maximize metropolitan profits at the colony's expense. They had reduced access uh, to metropolitan courts of justice, 
And most galling of all, they were unrepresented or underrepresented in metropolitan legislatures, making them, in effect, second-class subjects of their respective sovereigns. Uh, slide. So in my book, I place this extraordinary and complicated situation that Bolivar describes at the center of my account of the American independence movements. Uh, in order to understand how this situation influenced the ideology of what I call the Creole revolutions, I adopt a concept developed by the sociologist Eric Olin Wright. So Wright argues that the large middle class of managers, professionals, uh, and small capital owners that are common in advanced capitalist societies presents a problem for traditional Marxist social theory, uh, which depicts capitalism as characterized by the conflict of two opposed classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Wright's middle classes are neither bourgeois nor proletarian, but both. And because they share the interests of two classes whose interests are in contradiction with one another, these middle classes occupy what Wright calls a contradictory class location. So my claim is that the overlapping institutions of European imperialism placed Creoles in a position with analogous contradictions. Creoles were the vanguard of European colonization, working to advance their domination of the new world, but they were also the victims of European oppression, fighting for a measure of American autonomy. Uh, they were simultaneously privileged and marginalized, European and American. Uh, Creoles were neither colonizers nor colonized, but both. Uh, and in this sense, I argue, they occupied a contradictory institutional position, the one that, inv that, that invested them with conflicting interests. So, despite its contradictions, European rule of the Americas persisted and advanced for almost three centuries, uh, aided and abetted by the expansion of Creole communities across two continents. Uh, but in the course of the 18th century, Inter-imperial wars inspired institutional reforms within both the British and the Spanish empires. Uh, these reforms further curtailed Creole's autonomy within their colonies and further diminished their influence on metropolitan policymaking. They caused Creoles to worry that eventually, even their ability to exploit African labor and expropriate indigenous lands might be compromised. So, after many petitions and complaints, both British and Spanish Americans came to think that only independence could preserve their cherished rights. Uh, slide. Uh, but for the political theorists that would direct and defend the Creole revolutions, the prospect of independence entailed a deep dilemma. How could they end European rule of the Americas without undermining Creole rule in the Americas? And my book's most fundamental claim is that grappling with this common dilemma inspired the political theorists that led Creole revolutions throughout the hemisphere to produce a common ideology. I argue that the shared ideas and institutions that arose in the British and Spanish American independence movements reflect Creole's efforts to so resolve the shared problems inherent in the contradictory institutional position that European imperialism imposed upon them. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you how I defend that claim in just a moment. Uh, first, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on what exactly the ideologies of the American independence movements uh, had in common. Uh, slide, please. Uh, so, if you accept my characterization of the contradictory position imposed upon Creoles by the institutions of European imperialism, what follows regarding the ideology of the Creole revolutions? I argue that the political thought of the American independence movements was also contradictory. It was both anti-imperial and imperial at the same time. And as the revolutions progressed, this anti-imperial imperialism took on different forms, appearing first in the arguments that Creoles used to justify their independence, second in the constitutions Creoles designed to govern their new states, and third in the foreign policies that Creoles adopted, particularly with respect to the rest of the Americas. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about each of these. Uh, slide. Uh, so we are accustomed today to thinking of the leaders of the American independence movements as the expositors of important theories of natural or universal rights, rights to individual liberty, to national self-determination, uh, and other modern ideals. And we're also accustomed to qualifying our praise of these founding fathers by noting how regressive they were on slavery and racism, how blind they were to misogyny and other forms of inequality. Uh, too often, though, I think we simply write off these qualifications, these problems, as products of the time, 
and we fail to note the deep interconnections between the Creole revolution's liberalism and racism, uh, between their demo democracy and uh, elitism, uh, between their calls for universal inclusion and particular exclusion. Uh, but Creole political theorists struggled explicitly to reconcile these tendencies, uh, and they ultimately rested their case for independence on grounds narrow enough to sustain a critique of European empire that did not extend to the internal affairs of the colonies. So let me try to show you exactly what that looked like. Uh, slide. Uh, in 1774, the Virginian Thomas Jefferson drafted a petition to King George III, demanding that he exercise his royal prerogative to negate the British Parliament's recent efforts to impose taxes on the colonies. Uh, and in making his case against taxation without representation, Jefferson took pains to remind the king that our ancestors, before their emigration to America, were the free inhabitants of the British dominions in Europe. America was conquered and her settlements made at the expense of individuals and not of the British public. Their own blood was spilt in acquiring lands, their own fortunes expended in making that settlement effectual. For themselves they fought, for themselves they conquered, and for themselves alone they have a right to hold. So here, far from declaring that all men are created equal, Jefferson builds what will eventually be a case for American independence on rights that he and his fellow colonists bore as Creoles, rights that their forefathers carried with them across the Atlantic, or rights that they won in the course of conquering the New World. Now, these rights, importantly, not only entitled Creoles as Englishmen to political representation, but also as the descendants of conquerors to the land and the labor of non-European inhabitants of their colonies. Um, now, let me compare Jefferson to a Spanish-American uh, uh, colleague. Uh, slide, please. Uh, in 1809, Spanish-Americans learned that Napoleon Bonaparte had occupied Spain, deposed its king, and placed his brother Joseph on the throne. They also learned that Spaniards had risen in resistance and, in order to organize their efforts, had called for representatives from throughout the empire to assemble in a congress. Uh, Spanish Americans were initially thrilled to learn that they too had been invited to participate, but their excitement turned to outrage when they learned that their colonies had been allotted a much smaller number of representatives per, per capita than the European provinces of Spain. Uh, so this famous petition, written by a lawyer named Camilo Torres from New Granada, uh, present day Colombia, uh, was sent to Sevilla in response. Uh, the Americas, sir, are not composed of foreigners to the Spanish nation. We are sons, descendants of those who spilled their blood to acquire these new dominions for the Spanish crown. We are as Spanish as the descendants of Don Pelayo, and as deserving for this reason of the distinctions, privileges, and prerogatives of the rest of the nation, with this difference, if there is one, that our parents, as I have said, by means of indescribable labors, discovered, conquered, and populated this new world for Spain. Uh, to clarify, Don Pelayo is the 8th century Spanish nobleman who initiated the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula from the Moors. So this is a telling example, I think, for Torres to invoke. Uh, I want to focus, though, on the striking parallels in Torres and Jefferson's language, even more on the parallel claims that Torres and Jefferson make. Uh, neither Torres nor Jefferson opposed European rule because it was either monarchical or foreign. Uh, rather, both defended their revolutions as responses to the inequalities that imperialism imposed upon Creoles, and both described those inequalities as violations of rights that they bore specifically as Europeans and as the descendants of the New World's conquerors, rights to which indigenous or African Americans had no title. Uh, slide. So this is what I mean by anti-imperial imperialism. The Creole revolutions attacked inequalities imposed by imperial rule, but they did not attack the idea of empire in itself. They sought the independence of colonies, uh, but also sought to maintain a colonial social hierarchy. Um, so let me run through these other dimensions of anti-imperial imperialism uh, a bit more quickly. Uh, slide. Uh, as battlefield victories and the Revolutionary Wars brought independence within reach, the prospect of actually governing independent societies became central to Creole political thought. Both British and Spanish Americans feared that even if they managed to wrest independence away from their respective metropoles, their new states would remain exposed to the threat of reconquest from both established imperial powers across the Atlantic and rising ones within the Americas. 
At the same time, having mobilized large and diverse groups of people to confront their opponents, Creoles were forced to consider how they would reestablish social order and stable governance after victory. Uh, slide. Um, and in this way, this two-sided dilemma inherent in Creole revolutions persisted after independence had been won. And to confront it, Creole political theorists turned to constitutional design. What Creole constitutional designers sought were institutional arrangements capable of resisting reconquest and reestablishing internal order without reverting to the empires and monarchies they had overthrown. And facing this shared dilemma, these creative and learned individuals created constitutions in the Americas uh, that converged upon two shared institutions. Uh, the first is the union. Uh, this is a system of multi-level territorial authority, which united former colonies under common governments. Uh, within these unions, while states or provinces retained some autonomy in the governance of their internal affairs, common governments uh, conducted foreign policy on behalf of the collective, uh, regulated interactions between states or provinces, collected revenues, and enforced laws directly without state intermediation. Uh, throughout, these throughout the hemisphere, Creoles argued that these unions would help new states resist reconquest in many ways by coordinating defenses and negotiations with foreign powers, limiting infighting between states, improving fiscal and economic efficiency, and just generally making the American states larger and more formidable on the world stage. But unions would also help reestablish internal order, allowing Creole elites to coordinate responses to slave revolts, imposing uniformity on settlers' interactions with indigenous communities, and limiting the influence that the America's heterogeneous populations could exert in national policymaking. Uh, and within the central governments of these unions, Creole constitutional designers separated powers to create what comparative political scientists now call presidentialist systems. Uh, constitutions adopted throughout the Americas in the decades following independence created executive authorities that were independently elected to serve pre-established terms in office, endowing them with substantial autonomy in the appointment of cabinet members, substantial autonomy in the conduct of foreign affairs, and substantial powers to intervene in the legislative process. Like the Union, presidentialism served both foreign and domestic purposes. Individual executives would be capable of quicker and more consistent decision-making in emergencies, bringing greater energy to the oversight of warfare and diplomacy. Meanwhile, because they could not, in normal circumstances, be recalled by legislatures, but could intervene in the legislative process, executives would balance what many Creoles regarded as dangerously democratic legislative branches. Indeed, uh, Creole constitutional designers were so concerned with the potential for internal disorder that uh, presented by popularly elected assemblies that they added additional checks and balances alongside the executive, creating Baroque systems with bi or even tricameral legislatures empowering unelected life term serving judges and censors to invalidate legislation and oversee the operation of government. Uh, Creole political theorists defended their constitutional designs in sweeping terms, often adopting a rhetorical posture of speaking to the ages, uh, resolving problems that plagued all societies. And if we allow ourselves to be taken in by this presumption, it's easy to lose sight of the very specific two-sided dilemma that reflected in Creole constitutional thought. Both union and presidentialism were novel creations, representing the America's most important and lasting contributions to global constitutionalism. But both were adopted because they promised to solve particular problems, resisting reconquest and reestablishing internal order within post-colonial American societies. And both addressed these problems by mixing earlier constitutional models. Union offered a midpoint between the total dependence imposed upon colonies under an empire and the total independence of sovereign states within an international system. Presidentialism is a democratized version of the classic mixed constitution with an elected executive standing in for a hereditary monarch. Uh, in this sense, both constitutional designs embody the anti-imperial imperialism that I claim was characteristic of Creole political thinking in general. Um, slide. So I have time to say uh, even less about this third form of anti-imperial imperialism, uh, which appeared in the new American state's approach to foreign policy. Uh, uh, so though they won authority in struggles against empires, Creole statesmen did not hesitate to make territorial expansion and internal colonization cornerstones of their foreign policy. Uh, their revolutions were expansionist affairs from the very first, 
Small groups of men gathered in closed meetings to declare independence on behalf of vast populations with whom they consulted in only the most perfunctory fashion. Uh, their wars of independence often resembled imperial conquests as patriot armies descended on loyalist cities and brought them into the revolutionary fold at the point of a bayonet. They, they were often particularly brutal in their efforts to suppress African and indigenous communities that having little hope of improving their station under independent Creole regimes had joined forces with metropolitan armies. Now, all these expansionist efforts were paired with policies meant to hasten colonization of unsettled frontiers in the North American West, the Andean Altiplano, the Amazon Basin, and the Pampas of the Southern Cone. Uh, Creole administrations converged once again in their efforts to selectively encourage European settlement uh, uh, that they hoped would be loyal to their new nations. So these policies have been described in close detail by excellent scholars before. What my account helps us to understand is how and why these acts of forced liberation, expropriation, annexation, resettlement, and genocide were defended as necessary means of consolidating independence and of advancing revolutionary ideals. Uh, there were two main lines of argument here. First, Creole political thinkers argued that occupying adjacent territories and filling them with sympathetic inhabitants would deprive Europeans of a foothold or a fifth column that could help launch a reconquest. Uh, slide. Uh, consider uh, the blunt argument that Simon Bolivar offered his vice president as he readied the Colombian army to cross into royalist occupied vice royalty of Peru. He said, I should be permitted to advance on territories occupied by the Spanish in Peru because the enemy will come here if I do not contain him there. And because enemy territory should not be considered foreign territory, but conquerable territory, just as New Granada was for Venezuela. Anyone who denies this is a fool and a fool is no authority. Uh, so uh, 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 this is this first sort of form of uh, uh, aggressive anti-imperialism, imperialist anti-imperialism. But moving even beyond momentary and military concerns uh, to a second strain of their international political thought, Creoles also universally spoke of their new states in providential terms, citing the enlightened ideals and free institutions that would spread with the borders of, this, of their states. Uh, slide. Uh, consider this passage from the closing paragraphs of Federalist Number 11, written by Alexander Hamilton. Well, there, Hamilton describes the history of the world as a history of European imperialism, uh, describing the successive conquests of America, Asia, and Africa, and lamenting at the superiority that Europe has long maintained, has tempted her to plume herself as the mistress of the world and to consider the rest of mankind as created for her benefit. Facts have too long supported the arrogant pretensions of the Europeans. It belongs to us to vindicate the honor of the human race and to teach that assuming brother merit uh, moderation. So some stirring anti-imperial words here, but what exactly does Hamilton have in mind? He continues, slide. Let Americans disdain to be the instruments of European greatness. Let the 13 states bound together in strict and indissoluble union concur in erecting one great American system, superior to the control of all transatlantic force or influence and able to dictate the terms of the connection between the old and the new world. So here, half a century prior to the first articulation of Monroe's famous doctrine, we have a North American statesman envisioning a new American empire, uh, one not only capable of resisting European conquest, but actually of dictating the terms of connection between the entirety of the old and the entirety of the new world. Uh, so paradoxically here, precisely the accomplishment of independence from empire, and as with Bolivar, this aim of spreading the benefits of independence becomes central to the ideology that Creoles developed in order to defend their own imperial projects. Uh, ultimately, though, as Hamilton's idea of an American system already indicates, these expansionist tendencies of the Creole revolutions brought, brought them into conflict with one another, uh, nowhere more dramatically than in the North American West, where in 1848, the United States fulfillment of its manifest destiny came directly at Mexico's expense. Now, I think one of the most interesting insights I'm able to offer is a fresh perspective on this origin, these origins of inter-American relations. Uh, in my book, rather than describing the Monroe Doctrine, the Mexican-American War is the first encounters between Yankee imperialism and Latin American anti-imperialism, 
I show how anti-imperial imperialism shaped both America's outlooks in the early years of their independence. Uh, and in this way, I suggest that the imbalance of powers that characterizes the hemisphere today is not inevitable. Uh, and we can open the way then for critique and reform of the institutions that govern inter-American relations. Uh, slide. So I want to return to that last point in just a moment. Uh, first, let me give you a brief sense of how I support my interpretation and explanation of the ideology of Creole revolution systematically uh, using a method that I call comparative political theory, uh, which I've explained, uh, I've explained uh, in a recent article uh, that's noted there. Um, so the bulk of my book consists in an, of in-depth studies of three carefully chosen Creole revolutionaries, Alexander Hamilton in the United States, Lucas Alemán in Mexico, and Simón Bolívar in Venezuela. Now, all three of these figures were important political actors in their respective countries' transitions to independence, and all three are distinguished by the breadth and the depth of their intellectual contributions to those transitions. Uh, all three were also particularly explicit anti-imperial imperialists. Uh, all three justified American independence as a response to the unequal conditions imposed upon Creoles by European imperial rule, all three helped to design and defend constitutions that created political unions and presidentialist systems of separated powers. And all three sought to consolidate their new state's independence by expanding their territories and colonizing their frontiers. However, I've chosen Hamilton, Bolivar, and Aleman, not only because they all so effectively articulate a shared set of political ideas, but also because they each came to those ideas from very different philosophical starting points. So Alexander Hamilton's primary influences were the philosophers and historians and political economists of the Scottish Enlightenment, especially David Hume. From Hume, Hamilton adopted a method of analyzing politics, blending moral psychology, historical case study, to understand how natural human proclivities, established habits, and political institutions shaped the interaction of individual interests. This approach is clear in Hamilton's early writings on empire and revolution, and in his more mature interventions in the debate on the Constitution. Reading Hume's contemporaries, like Adam Smith, Hamilton developed a keen sense of the rising importance of commerce in international affairs, and he worked tirelessly to position the United States to, as he put it, aim at an ascendancy, both within its hemisphere and around the world. Uh, Simon Bolivar, meanwhile, was steeped in the tradition of classical republicanism developed by figures from Machiavelli to Montesquieu. His critique of Spanish rule centered on corruption that he thought it fostered amongst Spanish Americans, and he remained worried throughout his life uh, that his fellow citizens lacked the virtues requisite to rule themselves. His innovative constitutionalism sought to address this deficit, drawing on models from ancient Greece and Rome to build a sort of educative authoritarian regime meant to prepare Spanish Americans for freedom. Uh, his ambitions were every bit as grand as Hamilton's, but expressed in different terms. He looked forward to a future in which the Isthmus of Panama would host a global capital, a new Byzantium, in his words, uh, for the modern world. Uh, finally, Lucas Aleman uh, evinces a kind of complex conservatism, molded in large part by Edmund Burke. He supported Mexico's independence, but he was deeply wary of revolution and strongly committed to preserving elements of Spanish tradition in order to stabilize the new regime. Having witnessed at first hand the uprising <coughs> of indigenous... Sorry, my dog is barking in the background. Uh, uh, the uprising of indigenous and mixed race of Mexicans that preceded the independence movement, Aleman sought throughout his life uh, to create institutions that could control the country's internal divisions, exploit its enormous natural resources, and fend off the aggression of the rising colossus to its north. Uh, Aleman lived long enough, though, to witness his country's dismemberment, and he died deeply disappointed that Mexico had, in his words, advanced directly from infancy to decrepitude without having enjoyed more than a glimmer of the freshness of youth, nor given any other sign of life than violent convulsions. Now, as these short quotes illustrate, divergent philosophical influences deeply colored Hamilton, Bolivar, and Aleman's political thinking, and I don't claim that they are identical. Uh, rather, I show that despite their differences, Hamilton, Bolivar, and Aleman's ideas all display a common set of core contradictions, the anti-imperial imperialism that was characteristic of the ideology of Creole revolution. I argue that they converged in this sense because the institutional position each occupied as a Creole 
imposed similar dilemmas on their revolutionary political thinking. So it's precisely the differences between the three uh, that helps me to make this case by eliminating an important alternative explanation for their substantial areas of agreement. Um, so that gives you some sense of the book as a whole. Uh, I'd be happy to say more about the comparative argument about any of these three figures uh, if you have questions about them. Uh, for now, let me close by considering a couple of the implications of this work. So if you accept the most basic contention of my book, that the ideas and institutions produced in the course of the British and Spanish American independence movements were more similarly, similar than has usually been assumed, a range of interesting questions about the sources of difference between the contemporary United States and uh, Spanish America are opened up. Uh, slide. So uh, to return to the maps I started with, on the left, we have my map of the Creole revolutions, the, uh, the original territorial claims of the independence movements, including the United States, the Empire of Mexico, the Federation of the Andes, and the United Provinces of the Rio de la Plata. On the right, we have the map of the hemisphere as of 1850. So juxtaposed in this way, uh, these maps clearly point to a puzzle. Why is it that the United States transforms over the course of the first half of the 19th century from a small collection of colonies on the Atlantic seaboard into a continental state, while in the same period, the large states that emerge from Spanish America's wars of independence devolve and disintegrate into smaller ones. Why, in short, is the United States more successful in consolidating and expanding its union after independence than Latin America? Now, that's a big question, uh, one that could be investigated from a number of different perspectives, using different methods, different sorts of data. Uh, I, in my book, I apply my own approach, comparing the ideas of the first organized opposition parties that emerged in each of these four polities. And what I find is that the main issues driving post-colonial conflicts were the same throughout the Americas. In each new state, populist opposition parties arose to challenge the main tenets of Creole constitutionalism, demanding greater decentralization within their unions, greater legislative supremacy within their central governments. These opposition parties took advantage of rapidly expanding independent press outlets to denounce incumbent administrations as traitors to the revolutions that they had so recently led. Uh, incumbents in each state responded in similar ways, attempting to use powers at their disposal to suppress their opponents and thus raising the stakes of victory or defeat. So these early partisan conflicts brought all of the new American states to the brink of civil war. And it's at this brink that we encounter the origins of the divergence of the United States from Spanish America. So in my account, I emphasize the contingency of the different outcomes that we observe. The United States managed to negotiate a very narrow passage through its post-colonial conflicts, coming very close to civil war and dissolution on several occasions prior to the actual civil war in 1861. And it's only after that extraordinarily violent conflict that American political thinkers, British nor American political thinkers, stopped discussing the, br the breakdown of their union as a, an imminent possibility. The Spanish-American unions, meanwhile, broke apart on the reefs of partisan infighting, succumbing to secessions and civil wars that eventually drew the map that we are familiar with today. Uh, so ultimately, by comparing political ideas that emerged in the immediate aftermath of independence, I argue that neither the success of the union formed in the United States or the failure of the unions formed in Spanish America were inevitable. Alternative trajectories were possible in this critical juncture, which would have left the Americas looking very different than they do in fact look today. Now, uh, slide. Um, so if the success of the union in the North and its failure in the South were not inevitable, uh, they were extremely consequential. Uh, I, I published an article a few years ago which I explore one of the major consequences of this major important point of departure. Uh, there's a large literature in economic history and comparative politics on the America's development gap, the disparities in wealth and economic productivity uh, that began to emerge immediately after independence and that continue to divide the United States and Latin America today. Uh, the most influential current explanations of this gap argue that the America's present day differences are the legacies of institutions installed under British and Spanish rule which have persisted across centuries to work their positive or negative effects on economic growth. In this article, I take issue with that interpretation, arguing that the success or the failure of political unions formed after independence had both direct and indirect effects on subsequent patterns of economic development. And I support that intervention by comparing the economic arguments that the founders of these unions made, 
showing that both Americans and Span British Americans and Spanish Americans understood how large states might in and of themselves be an advantage for economic growth and that both Americans and British Americans and Spanish Americans uh, planned to use the powers that unions were put at their disposal to reform the institutions that they, that they had inherited from Britain and Spain. Thus, I suggest that had the unions of Spanish America survived, or conversely, and perhaps more likely, had the Union of the United States collapsed, the America's development gap would not be as large today as it actually is. Uh, slide. Uh, finally, uh, uh, consider inter-American relations. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Creole Revolution's analogous foreign policies eventually brought them into conflict with one another, as states equally devoted to anti-imperial imperialism sought to protect their own independence and spread their free institutions by conquering adjacent territories and colonizing their frontiers. As the 19th century progressed and the United States reaped the advantages of its union, these contests became increasingly unbalanced. American interventions in Spanish America became increasingly frequent, and defining and defending uh, Spanish America against the United States became increasingly central to Latin American, to Spanish American, Latin American maybe more generally political thought. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, what's interesting here though, is how the ideology of anti-imperial imperialism persisted and changed, evolving into the imperial internationalism that the United States used to justify its efforts to project its influence throughout the hemisphere and the world, and into the ideology of anti-imperial internationalism that Latin Americans deployed as part of their efforts to organize global resistance to expanding Yankee hegemony. Uh, so by the turn of the 20th century, advocates of American interventionism abroad, like Theodore Roosevelt, who's up in that upper right-hand corner, uh, justified their proposals by reference to the superior ideals and virtues of the United States Anglo-Saxon population, citing the benefits that American rule would bring to the backward peoples of the world. Latin American opponents of American interventionism, like Jose Marti, in the bottom left-hand corner there, uh, rejected these arguments, but they did so in an interesting way. Marti and several of his contemporaries insisted that Latin America, Nuestra America, had a decisive role to play in world history, that Latin Americans were developing a model of peaceful coexistence and racial equality that would one day replace the aggressive expansion in Anglo-Saxon supremacy modeled by the United States. And in this way, uh, to employ a term of art, uh, Marti offered an imminent critique of the ideology of American imperialism defended by figures like, Jose, uh, like Theodore Roosevelt. He built an alternative theory of history that positioned Nuestra America, our America, Latin America, to offer the world a fuller realization of the ideals that political theorists in both Americas had invoked in the course of their independence movements. And he made this theory of history the basis of a call for Latin American solidarity, perhaps even union, in the face of North American aggression. But I think this intellectual dynamic can be traced in inter-American relations from the Spanish-American War to the Cuban Revolution, from positivism and post-positivism to Marxism and modernization theory. Uh, and I, in fact, I think that this dynamic still plays a role in inter-American relations, informing competing proposals uh, for hemispheric political and economic institutions. Uh, but I will leave that argument uh, for another day slide. Uh, but for now, let me just thank you very much for your attention. Uh, mucho obrigado. Uh, uh, be glad to answer, to hear your presentations and uh, answer any of your questions. Thank you, Joshua. It was really nice, uh, profound and interesting. Uh, it was really clear, gives a, a really good idea of your book. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, make my remarks. But firstly, uh, following the sequence of our event, uh, I will give the word to Professor Gustavo Cabral. I will make also a short uh, introduction, presentation of him. And, um, and for him also to say some uh, uh, first words uh, in the name of the postgraduate law program of Universidade Federal de Ceará. So, um, Gustavo Cabral has a PhD in history of law granted by the Universidade de São Paulo, State University of São Paulo, and is currently an, ass an assistant professor in Universidade Federal do Ceará, uh, where also currently hold position as a coordinator, coordinator of the law postgraduate program. He had also several experiences as a visiting scholar 
em institutions such as Universidade Autônoma de Madrid, Maastricht e Nova Lisboa, Portugal. Uh, he is also author and contributor to several books and chapters uh, in our subject today. So, uh, once more, uh, with, with, without further talks, uh, Gustavo, you have the mic. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, Professor Joshua Simon for joining us in this evening. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, to be better if, if you'd be here, uh, uh, if, your, if your presence was, uh, I mean, a corporal presence, I mean, uh, if, if I may say, uh, but I mean, uh, in, in this uh, strange time we are living, uh, I, I think that uh, having this, these moments, at, at least virtually, are, 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 are what we have. So uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, in, uh, speaking uh, in the name of uh, the Graduate Studies Programming Law of the Federal University of Ceará, I, I think uh, I thank Professor Felipe Castro, uh, who is also uh, the host of, of this of this seminar, and I thank also uh, the audience here. Uh, I, I didn't prepare. Uh, uh, Presentation. I mean, slides. Uh, I'm I'm not that organized, so uh, I'm sorry for that. But I prepared a, a text uh, on my presentation, which is entitled "Narratives of the Independence: Oliveira Lima and the Birth of the Brazilian Empire." I, I think uh, uh, preparing a, a text is better to the audience. I mean, uh, I think the ideas uh, are more connected, and, and and then we we can uh, maybe have a a, a, a better result. As any other relevant fact, Brazilian independence process was a dispute, uh, disputed object among historians and politicians. The foundation of Brazilian national history in the, uh, in the 1940s by the newborn Brazilian Historical and Geographical Institute adopted a different perspective compared to, for example, the historiography that arose from the 1930s onwards the following decades by the so-called uh, interpreters of Brazil, such as Sérgio Buarque de Holanda and Caio Prado Júnior. Since the facts are, uh, are less relevant than the interpretation men give them, I opted for a study on historiography and the connections between facts of the past, their interpreters, and the contemporary political context they were inserted in. The leading figure of this talk is Manuel de Oliveira Lima, 1867-1928, uh, a prominent character in Brazilian cultural life during the First Republic uh, that lasts between 1889-1930. Born in the province of Pernambuco in a wealthy family linked to the agrarian aristocracy, Oliveira Lima served as diplomat between 1890 and 1913 and spent most of his life abroad since his youth when he did, when he did his undergraduate studies in philology and literature in Lisbon, a very different option if we consider the path often taken by the huge majority of intellectuals and public men in Brazil at that time who used to go to law schools. Such years in Lisbon were crucial, at least in two aspects of his life. His humanist education provided him with skills in areas in which he acted for a long time, such as literature, paleography, and history. At the same time, he established a lasting and deep relation with Portugal that marked his works, not only those dedicated to literary studies, but particularly, particularly his texts on Brazilian history. In short, Brazil and Portugal shared a tradition that began during the colonial age and was not broken, and it was not broken within the independence. Most of his historical works assumed assume and try to prove this uh, hypothesis through a large use of documental sources he consulted in archives around Europe. Unlike many Brazilian intellectuals of his time, Oliveira Lima circulated worldwide during most of his life. He served as diplomat in Portugal, Germany, Japan. He was uh, the first Brazilian ambassador uh, uh, in Tokyo between uh, 1901 and 1902. Belgium, uh, Venezuela, England, and the United States. 
and gave lectures and conferences in many, many other countries, uh, uh, such as uh, Sweden. After his retirement from the diplomatic service, he definitely moved to the, uh, to, uh, to the US and acted as professor there. Firstly, as guest professor uh, for the recently created chair of Latin American studies at Harvard University between, Harvard University between 19, uh, 1915 and 1916, and later on as professor for international law at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC until his death in 1928. His library and particular collections, including scrapbooks, paintings, sculptures, and maps are part of the CUA collection since 19, uh, 1916. He, he was also the first uh, curator uh, of, of his own collection. Oliveira Lima li uh, uh, lived abroad most of his life and spent only short periods in Brazil. It does not mean, however, that Brazil did not have a real role in his, in, in his life. On the contrary, he wrote to Brazilian newspapers for years, particularly, uh, particularly the still existing Estado de São Paulo and Journal, of, uh, Journal do Comércio, with remarks on contemporary literature and political affairs. But his major, major works were dedicated to the, to the Brazilian colonial and imperial history. In, his, in, in the lectures he gave, he gave uh, at Stanford University during the academic year, of 1912, which were published two years later, as, later under the title The Evolution of Brazil Compared with, uh, with That of Spanish and Anglo-Saxon America, Oliveira Lima pointed out some relevant topics in Brazilian history and offered particular, explana particular explanations for them. In what he called race problem, for example, Oliveira Lima used anthropological theories, which were very popular in the beginning of the 20th century, to state that mulattoes did not, quotation here, truly form a race, but an ethical type, variable, transitory, and having a tendency to return to one of the races, and that the constant increase in the number of white immigrants, sexual selection, and the disappearance of race prejudice are cooperating towards the extinction within a short time of the mulattoes in Brazil, a country that a country which will become in the future, and, and according to all indications, in the not far distant future, a nursery of the white race and a center of Latin civilization. End of end of quotation. Uh, about slavery, which was the real reason why Africans are displaced were displaced by force to Brazil only a short paragraph according to which it was a peculiar institution. And on the indigenous natives, he acknowledged, acknowledged that they were, uh, quotation, badly treated, violated, enslaved by the conquerors, uh, conquerors from, the, from the Iberian Peninsula. But the presence of religions, religious missionaries was responsible for contending with them for his new portion of humanity in order to elevate it by education and precept." End of quotation. This lower, lower social strata, which also included poor people, were not among those who actually had a leading role in politics. This elitist perspective in Oliveira Lima's narrative becomes clear when he stated that, quotation, in the Latin American countries, the idea of independence was not embodied in men of plebeian origin, but in the aristocracy, a circumstance that really corresponds to the existing moral and social status of the nobility and common people." End of quotation. That is to say, the independence was a movement top-down led, planned and coordinated by the elites and accepted and supported by people whose role was providing legitimacy to the decisions taken by the leaders. In his book, The Movement of the Independence, 1821-1822, published in uh, 1922, Oliveira Lima portrayed, uh, uh, portrayed, uh, portrayed the aristocracy leadership of the Brazilian independence process, particularly the, the Portuguese royal family and the support of popular strata, as the following excerpt illustrates. In Brazil, national aspiration was embodied in the, dyna uh, in the dy uh, dynastic representative and, uh, the, sorry, uh, I, I'm going to read this again, sorry. In Brazil, national aspiration was embodied 
in the uh, dynastic representative that land accommodated in a period of affliction. Local resistance did not happen. Such upper strata were aware of their role, while, according to Oliveira Lima, people were not, enough mat were not mature enough to understand their role. In his words, before their political emancipation, people should achieve a, a civil emancipation. In the independence of Spanish America, uh, if the independence of Spanish America was led by local elites, the, the Creole uh, in, in Joshua's, uh, in, in Professor Simon's uh, uh, work better, Professor Simon, <laughs> uh, to the leadership of, the, of Libertadores like Morelos, Hidalgo, Bolivar, uh, who were often mentioned in his books, Braganza dynasty had a prominent role in Brazil. The presence of the Portuguese court in Rio de Janeiro between 1808 and, uh, and, uh, and 1821 illustrates a huge difference between Portuguese and Spanish America since Rio de Janeiro became the head of a seaborne empire whose possessions extended to five continents and was the center of all decisions until the outbreak of a liberal revolution in Portugal that, among other things, imposed the return of the king to the peninsula, established a new order based on popular sovereignty and no more on the royal sovereignty, but tried to reestablish the subordinated status of Brazil. This reaction, paradoxically, paradoxically conducted by the revolutionaries in Portugal, would certainly result in an independence movement in Brazil. In the book that is considered his masterpiece, Don Juan the Sixth in Brazil, published in 1908. This is the last ed edition of this book, right here. Oliveira Lima tries to, to rebuild the image of, of the king as a wise leader who was the guardian of the integrity of the crown during the French invasion when he decided to cross Atlantic Ocean with thousands of courtesans, including the royal family and his counselors and ministers. To our author, Don Juan actually was the founder of the nation, particularly after the elevation of the former colony to a, a, to a United Kingdom with Portugal and Algarves in 1816, which was, uh, which was somehow the actual milestone to Brazilian autonomy, autonomy. As he remarks in the conclusion of his books, Don Juan VI came to America and actually founded here an empire and it thus deserves to be classified his action of providing an immense amorphous colony with nationality. The documents consulted by Oliveira Lima convinced him about the role of Don Juan in advising his son, the Prince Don Pedro, to undertake the independence process. Since it would happen anyway, then it would be better if it was under the leadership of a member of the royal family, particularly the heir of the crown. According to Oliveira Lima, such movement was responsible for the maintenance of dynastical bonds between Brazil and Portugal. The adoption of the monarchy as the form of government, contrasting with all, new, uh, all other newborn Latin American countries, except Mexico for two short periods, uh, Iturbide and Maximiliano uh, de Habsburgo, would explain a rare stability in the continent. In many texts, Oliveira Lima does not hide his sincere sympathy for the Brazilian monarchy, as uh, the, this excerpt of the, the evolution of Brazil compared with that of Spanish and Anglo-Saxon America exemplifies. Imperial Brazil constituted a model of liberty and peace for Latin America and fur, uh, furnished at least a real image of civilization reflected from the throne at the time when Spanish American society struggled in disorder and savagery. His most relevant historia historiographical works, uh, Don João VI no Brasil, O Movimento da Independência, and uh, O Império do Brasil, focused on this period and acknowledged what he considered relevant progresses arising from the monarchy. However, some of his texts were consider considered as uh, excessively no, nostalgic of the deposed regime, particularly in a context when part of the public opinion was disappointed with the paths taken by the Republic. The defeat of the so-called civilian campaign, in Portuguese, campaign civilista, uh, 
and the victory of the candidate Marshal Ernest da Fonseca in the 1910 presidential election brought about in a short revival of the monar monarchist movement among some social groups and an impact on the press, particularly after the publication of two manifests by the Crown Prince Don Luis de Orleans de Bragança in 1909 and 1913. On September 9, uh, 1910, Oliveira Lima published a, a text entitled A Brazilian Prince in the Brazil's uh, Pavilion in Brussels, um príncipe, um príncipe Brasileiro no Pavilhão do Brasil em Bruxelas, in which he reinforces his thesis of the singularity of Brazilian situation due to its monarchical experience, which was, quotation, which was repre uh, represented by the stay of the Lisbon court in Rio de Janeiro and the elevation of Brazil to a united kingdom and the head of the wide Portuguese monarchy. To him, the monarchy saved the union of the country, contrary to what happened in Spanish America. Under the emperor, Dom Pedro II, no injustice was voluntarily perpetrated. perpetrated. The regent, Princess Isabel, signed the law that abolished the slavery despite the risk of losing her throne, what, ac uh, what, uh, what actually uh, happened. And the empire was remembered as, in, as on, on, uh, benign, hostile to every tyranny and disgrace, and most importantly, a time when freedom of opinion was granted. After a brief but laudatory portrait of Prince, uh, of Prince Don Luis, grandson of the, of the last emperor, Oliveira Lima supported his claim for the revocation of the royal family's ban, which only happened, uh, happened in uh, 1921 after the death of, of, of Don Luis, and reaffirmed the necessity of every liberal and advanced regime to tolerate opposition of ideas and severe critics. He mentioned two tolerant monarchies, England and Belgium, to contrast with the Latin American republics, which uh, uh, quotation here, defend by shooting and with force the access to power. And he finished the article with a strong statement, the, the imperial, uh, imperial restoration, if it should be done and if it could be done, would only have the approval of the dynasty after the popular vote and with a supreme and unquestionable manifestation of the national will. The monarchist movement did not, did not move forward, but Oliveira Lima suffered with the effects of his dubious position. He was not appointed for the, embassy, uh, the, for the embassy in London, as he wished, and then opted for a premature retirement from the diplomatic service before achieving the higher positions in the, in, in the career. His studies on Oliveira Lima, such as those recently published by Antonio Arnone Prado, Julio César Veloso and Natalia Heinrich emphasized his monarchist convergence, which was not absolutely rare about Brazilian intellectuals in the last decade of the 19th century and the first, uh, and the first, of, uh, and the first decade of the following one, as the examples of Joaquim Nabucco, Eduardo Prado, Afonso Celso, the Baron of Rio Branco, among others, testify. But my point is a little, is a little different. Much more than a political position for the present and the future, Brazilian monarchy was part of a narrative according to which Brazil was brought closer to the civilized countries, working as a link between Europe, which represented civilization, and the still new world. Wild independence was a movement toward maturity and self-determination, but preserving the European roots symbolized by a crowned democracy under a traditional dynasty, the Republic represented somehow a break in this path to the civilization and demanded a well-reasoned explanation by the author that maybe, uh, maybe would not be necessary if we had continued to be a monarchy. The historical works of Oliveira Lima are a sort of justification of the position of Brazil among the civilized countries. Belonging to this group depended on the monarchy and on the independence process as it happened. This is the reason why he opened his last book, The Brazilian Empire, by quoting the, the uh, Venezuelan president 
Juan Pablo Rojas Paul. Uh, when he uh, and then uh, when uh, uh, Juan Pablo Rojas Paul uh, was informed about the deposition of the Emperor Pedro II, he affirmed, "Se ha acabado la única república que existía en América, el Imperio de Brasil." Thank you. Um, it is strange. I mean, I I I I, I finished my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, 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 I'm gonna uh, present. I mean, introduce our next guest. I mean, it's it's not a guest; it's a host, co-host. Uh, but but I, I think it's it's important to uh, to present um, Professor Philip Philip Araújo Castro. Uh, Professor Castro is uh, graduated in in law by the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, where he also finished his master in law. And he got also uh, a PhD in law at the Federal University of Minas Gerais since, I guess, uh, 20, uh, 2017, I guess, or 2016. I mean, uh, uh, since a couple of years, uh, he's professor uh, of uh, constitutional law and, and legal history at the Federal University of Semi of Semiárido, UFESA, and and he's now also uh, doing uh, uh, a postdoctoral research uh, with us here uh, at the Federal University of Ceará, and uh, part part of his research will be presented right now, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very much, Felipe, for for this idea of organizing uh, this, this seminar. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Gustavo. Uh, I believe uh, I would like uh, once more to thank you, uh, the audience, to thank to Professor Joshua and you for being here uh, late at night, uh, here hearing my poor English. So I apologize in advance. And, and I would like to say that uh, the presentation of Joshua and Gustavo made my work um, easier. So many of the subjects um, were already treated, so I can um, uh, choose another angle to work. So uh, after hearing Joshua explain his book, I decided to start with a quotation that I believe you're gonna think uh, it's a really interesting. Uh, about a newspaper uh, in Brazil, a monarchical newspaper uh, called O Papagaio, uh, uh, the parrot. Uh, I don't know the name in English. So, so the, it's the, the animal that uh, stays in the shoulder of the pirate. I, I forgot it. Sorry. Uh, from six, uh, some September, September 6th of 1822, therefore, uh, just before uh, independence. So the quotation uh, I'm translating right now, so uh, I'm sorry it's, it's not accurate, uh, is, is as, as follow. Uh, a thousand times fortunate our patria, that being the last one to raise the flag of its deserved freedom, uh, because precisely for that reason, for being the last one, uh, has less dangerous uh, obstacles to surpass and, is, and more examples to follow. So this number of this paper uh, follow it uh, a description of uh, the situation in the Empire of Mexico because it was uh, it to be the time so it was a, a monarchy constitutional no so that was the example that supposed to be followed it. like it was a process of learning from Spanish American independence revolutions and civil wars so. Uh, it appears at the moment that the, mon the monarchical constitutional solution was the one uh, that was possible to avoid all those problems. So that, that's, that's something that I will work on my idea today. So as we already saw in the ideology of Creole revolution, uh, Simon, Joshua Simon argued that the Creole elites had a common problem in America uh, 19th century, right? Uh, namely, how could it be possible to reconcile uh, uh, ideas of freedom and equality uh, 
uh, invoke the guide principles of the independence uh, with the structures of uh, oppression exploitation upon which their society were actually built on. So in addressing this issue, those Creole political thinkers developed uh, a apparently contradictory anti-imperialistic imperialistic ideology aimed both at their metropolis and at their inner population and neighbors. So in short, it was a question of breaking colonial ties while recreating social political structure, structures that would guarantee, firstly, the privileges of the racial and social hierarchies of the colonial period. Secondly, national integrity against reconquest and, if possible, expansion of this territory. And finally, the maintenance of internal order, as Joshua already presented. So the main threat to this internal order was seen as the anarchy represented by the mestizos fraction of the population, from which San Domingo's revolution in Haiti, uh, nowadays Haiti, served as the best example of what to be avoided. Uh, so I will return to these three main points at the end of my speech. So uh, Simon works with the British and Spanish America colonies, as he put it. No? So it compares Creole political thinkers as Hamilton, Alemán, and Bolívar. So he argues that his approach would have very little to say about Brazil, considering that the former Portuguese colony would have followed a much different path toward independence uh, under the leadership of a legit heir of the Portuguese front, is a quotation of the, of the book. I want to respectfully dispute that argument, demonstrating how his approach actually applies really, we really well to the Brazilian political emancipation. So indeed, Brazil has become an empire ruled by a legit heir of the Bragança dynasty. But the independence process was not effectively led by Dom Pedro I. On the contrary, much like other emancipations throughout the hemisphere, it was a process mainly led by white Creole elites. Together, uh, in a consortium with Portuguese traders, and an enlarged and increasingly empowered state bureaucracy, especially from 1808 on forwards, uh, when the royal family migrates to Brazil. I will first focus my remarks on a key figure of the victorious Creole project, José Bonifácio de Andrade Silva, for later contrast the centralized monarchy project put forward by him with a more decentralized and autonomous project represented by Fei Caneca at Pernambuco province. My main intention is to show the coexistence of different nation projects in Portuguese America uh, 19th century, early 19th century, that also articulated anti-imperialistic, imperialistic ideology, influenced not only by American and French revolution, but especially by the Spanish American revolutions. And from here, uh, I take uh, a lot of the development made by João Paulo Pimenta in a book about uh, comparing revolutions in the Spanish America. So uh, I believe that José Bonifácio could properly figure uh, in the comparison with Ham Hamilton, Alemán, and Bolívar as developed by Simon. That is the case, less due to the fact that Bonifácio is recognized as a founding father, to Brazilian nation and more for he having shared many positions on many questions faced by all these political thinkers, such as uh, notably strong mistrust towards the mestizo population, his flirting with the possibility of forging a League of American countries with defensive purpose, his defense of a strong centralized executive branch, but to be yelled by the emperor in the Brazilian case, and of course, his dubious position on slavery. Huh? Bonifacio usually presented himself as against slavery, but showed enormous tolerance to the existing system. So uh, leaving behind any romantic narrative that overestimated Bonifacio's role in Brazilian independence, sometimes drawing the Brazilian politician as a genius or a demon, I want to explore his, his career uh, through the lens of rela a, a relational historical and sociological perspective, uh, from which uh, uh, I am deep influenced by the work of Pierre Bourdieu on his lectures on, on, on state, on the state, I guess. Uh, 
There is. I want to consider the changing in his political thinking, aching his variable institutional positions within the political field over time. So, uh, first, while living at the expense or serving in different capacities to the Portuguese crown from 1789 to 1819, José Bonifácio defended the restoration of the Portuguese nation. Uh, that was already seen uh, as a decaying empire, uh, mailing to the cultural reasons as a malice heritage from Spanish occupation of the, of the region, of the territory, Peninsula Ibérica, I don't know how to say in English. The idea then was to restore old Portuguese values associated with the birth of the monarchy around the 12th century. Those features were allegedly lost with the luxury promoted by wealth accumulation during the seaside expansion. So at the end of 1810s, the decay of the Portuguese empire had only grown further, uh, culminating with the invasion of, of its territories by the Napoleon troops and the fleeing of the royal family to Brazil. The restoration seems now increasingly unlikely. So after his retirement from public officers, officers Followed by his return to Brazil in 1819, Bonifacio already saw no more possibilities of a restoration. Moving then to an idea of a regeneration of the Portuguese nation, but now in American soil. Finally, Bonifacio only started to advocate for a more radical form of emancipation when the independence without reconciliation was seen as inevitable what probably happened shortly after the Liberal Revolution 1820 in Porto. At this point, he joined those demanding a forge of a new nation. It's inter interesting to note, uh, as Joshua said in his presentation, that those Creole elites stayed monarchical until the very end. Né? It, as we see uh, as well in Frank Fericaneca, even being a, even more radical and federalist uh, Creole political thinker. So we have no time to explore each of these periods of Bonifacio political thinking. I want to just to say that uh, the, first, uh, the first period, the restoration, can be uh, found uh, explicit in, between 1812 and 1819, when he was a secretary to the Academia de Letras Portuguesas, while the passage from restoration to regeneration is well marked at his last address to the same institution in 1819. Therefore, with his uh, package ready to come back to Brazil. In this speech, Bonifacio exposed a critic of the Portuguese empire by contrast with, of, with, contrast with his optimistic view of the Brazilian future. For him, the Portuguese America could flourish as, quote, quote, a Brazilian monarchy that would glean in the universal history, end of quote, because here there were not enough people of powerful classes that could be um, able to separate their own interests from those of the nation, as well because here the clergy was free of useless riches. In short, the vices of the old brain were so deeply rooted that it was no longer possible to restore its former glory. It was necessary to start brand new somewhere free of those vices. With this return, Bonifacio hoped with a barely high false modesty to be something as a Thales or Pythagoras for ancient, uh, for classic Greek, bringing the lights né, of science that would regenerate the nation. Nonetheless, as we saw, the regeneration project wouldn't last longer. The liberal constitution of Porto would seal up for good the possibilities of reconciliation among Portugal and Brazil rhymes. The pression coming from the Cortes, demanded the immediately return of the royal family to Portugal, would at least represent a downfall in the political status of the Brazilian reign, and for many would represent recolonization itself, with all the problems of the, uh, to the weak representation of the colonies in the metropolitan politics that Joshua also quoted. With his interests now deeply embedded in Brazilian territory, Bonifacio would finally embrace the emancipation project, 
leading a political group that would successfully conduct the Brazilian independence as it was. A highly centralized monarchy based on large scale, scale slavery. It is far to say that this group, composed by South Brazilian agrarian Creole elites, were the winners of the independence, at least at the first round, considering there were no other nation projects in dispute, such as Pernambuco claims of autonomy. Nonetheless, it is also fair to say that the Bonifacio views for the future of the nation were not fully implemented, since his ideas were soon to be defeated by a more conservative fraction from the same Creole elites. So let's go to Caneca now. Our intention in contrasting the political writings of Bonifacio with Frey Caneca is in, in inquiring why two political thinkers coming from the same social strata, white Creole elites, with, sh with a shared goal, political emancipation of Portuguese America, and plunge it in a much alike intellectual contest, though these of the Enlightenment from constitution constitutionalism, co quoting the same authors, né, had formulated opposite answers to the main issue of their time. Né? In our perspective, following Josso Schamel's intuition in, his, in this work that he, he also mentioned in his presentation, uh, is, to ex the, uh, is that the explanation should be found in the institutional positions that these men had and also in some idiosyncrasies of their biographies. So, Frei Joaquim do Amor Divino Caneca, or simply Frei Caneca, was a Brazilian priest and scholar that actively participated in the autonomous movement in the Pernambuco province, northeast of Brazil, in the early 19th century, from 1817 to 1824. As Bonifácio, he was a descendant to Portuguese settlers, but not as wealthy as the Andradas. Instead of a rich merchant, his father was a planning artisan. Once more like Bonifácio, Caneca was pushed towards a higher education. Although unlikely the former, Caneca stayed in Portuguese America through his whole life, probably due to the lack of resources to finance his study abroad in Coimbra, like, uh, as, usual, uh, as usual at the time. In fact, in his short life, Caneca never lived Pernambuco as a free man. In the absence of universities in Brazilian soil, the alternative for a higher education was confessional seminars. In this sense, it is not surprisingly that the clergy had a central role in spreading Republicans' ideas throughout the, the Brazilian territory, huh? as, shown by, as shown by historian Eloisa Starling, that go as far as saying that Olinda Seminar has worked as a beacon for the Enlightenment in Pernambuco and Northeast region. Frey Caneca thinking, therefore, was forged in this intellectual context, inside a province that hold autonomous inclinations that could trace it back at least to the expulsion of the Dutch in, in 1654. Myth or reality, the shared notion in, the, in this Brazilian province was that by expelling the invaders with its own resources, the people of Pernambuco had regained their sovereignty and only by an act of will had returned to be a part of the Portuguese empire. Therefore, the failing by the crowd in fulfilling this new contract would grant the right of the province to rebel. In short, we want to sustain that Frey Caneca was better fit to assume a radical nativist cause, advocating for a federalist form of government that would guarantee local autonomy. That was that case, not only because he had only lived in Pernambuco, but especially because he had only experienced the metropolitan presence in the side of those paying taxes, and never on the side of those collecting and reallocating wealth. By the, end, by the, by the 1820s, the dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction of the province of Pernambuco had only grown, grown further, due to political and economic burdens related with the migration of the royal family to Rio de Janeiro. At the other end, Bonifacio owned his professional and political success entirely to the crown. Besides, he was now located in a region deeply favored by the migration of the royal family to the Brazilian uh, territory, 
from a place where he could defend a centralized monarchy project that he hoped to constrain and control. Therefore, these different institutional positions can explain the opposite projects of independence held by these two political thinkers. In a book called uh, The Other Independence, Evaldo, Evaldo Cabral de Mello argues that federalism was a particularly sensibility of Pernambuco in early uh, 19th century Brazil. There is, although it was present in other regions, it was especially encrusted there, partially due to the influence of the American Revolution that came with the Atlantic trade. Nonetheless, that does not mean that the Creole elites of this province were necessarily separatists. In fact, the fraction represented by Caneca avoided, as long as it was possible, a radical revolution. As a learning from previous insurgencies in 1817, their movement privileged, privileged above all local autonomy, but only favored republic, a republican form meaning it was willing to sacrifice the second uh, in the auto of the constitutional monarchy in as much as that meant effective political autonomy. It was only after the shutdown of the 1823 assembly, when it was plain clear there was no room for local autonomy, that the fraction of the Pernambuco elite radicalized, and with them, Frey Caneca. So uh, I'm going for my conclusions. So at this point, uh, I believe it is clear that the comparative approach developed in the ideology of the revolution has more to say about Brazilian 19th century than his author first supposed. I believe so. Moreover, if I am right, it is possible to say that the Brazilian independence was the most successful Creole revolution. If we, if we consider success, the realization of the three key goals I first pointed out here. There is conserving ra racial and social hierarchies, national integrity, and internal order. So if you come back to the maps, you're going to see that the Brazil stays the same. It only goes a little bit né, bigger and some edges. So in this sense, I want to argue that the political emancipation that took place in Portuguese America, giving birth to an empire sustained in large scale slavery, was the most conservative of all American independence, nonetheless still a revolution. 31 years later, it was the most perfect anti-Haitian emancipation. Uh, it, my hypothesis is that the process led by the Brazilian Creole elites was so successful that never came to be a liberal revolution. Returning to José Bonifácio, although he is still seen as the father of our nation, there is only partially correct. It is more appropriate to say that he was a key political player in conducting independence. But in 1822, the nation was not forged, as shown by the insurgencies throughout Brazil, from which Pernambuco Autonomous Movement were only one example. The ministry led by the Andradas brother was undone together with the 1823 assembly and were replaced by an even more conservative cabinet, representing fraction of Creole elite linked by soil and blood to slavery. So would be these groups the main actors behind the forging of the Brazilian nation and its imperial state, monarchical, centralized at Rio de Janeiro and based on slavery. Uh, through 1830s, those conservative Creole elites would reinvent slavery as a modern institution that would allow the continuity of a primitive accumulation, inserting the new empire in the global market in an old colonial fashion as a commodity exporter. Between external economic pressure and internal racial and social tension, slavery would endure until the dawn of the republic and would taint it for good. So those are my uh, remarks for today's presentation. Oh, thank you. So, uh, really, we did not uh, discuss about the this last part. I don't know if we will open to uh, questions or if we give back the word to Joshua so he can comment on our comments. So, what do you think would be best? Uh, 
I can say two things. Uh, make a brief couple of cool. comments here, and then and then I'd love to hear questions. If not talk anymore, or I can talk in response to the audience interest. Um, thank you for those two spectacular presentations. What a pleasure to to be able to learn so much about uh, Brazilian history, which is a a total weak spot or blind spot in my own uh, knowledge. And these are these were two fascinating figures who I, I, I kind of knew uh, a little bit, but had never invested enough time in. And uh, uh, so thank you for these great uh, accounts of their thinking. Really, really interesting. Um, maybe I'll speak to Felipe's first and, uh, and, and, and then to, uh, uh, to Gustavo's. Uh, Felipe, I, I love this kind of criticism. Uh, this is the best criticism I've ever had, that uh, my book explains more than I thought, so I'll take it. Uh, and I, I think you're, the broader point you're raising, at the more challenging point, that Brazil is the most successful Creole revolution, is a really interesting one. Um, I, and I would say, frankly, you can have it. Uh, you, Brazil is, ha is welcome to the, to the title of most successful Creole revolution. I mean, in part, I, I suppose, it, it, hopefully it's a useful framework for understanding some contemporary problems as you got to at the very end of your talk there. Uh, and not just racial dynamics within these countries, which obviously, again, is a point that we share in the United States and Brazil and in Spanish America, but uh, the, the, the ways that these constitutions uh, 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 born in this period uh, uh, help and do not help to solve these problems that we have. So presidentialism being a persistent source of uh, 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 stability in one period, but can also be a cause of instability. Uh, uh, and I, I think that's an interesting uh, uh, common point to draw there. I also like Frey Kaneka. What a fascinating figure. I mean, I think you could do more even with comparisons to other pairs of figures in some of these other cases. Uh, uh, leaders of uh, radical federalist leaders in some of these other cases. Uh, uh, you know, comparing the Hamilton-Jefferson comparison might be an analogy to your Bonifacio uh, Kaneka uh, or Aleman, actually another priest, Fray, Ter Fray Servando Teresa de Meyer in Mexico, uh, similar in many ways to the account you've just given of Fray Kaneka. So I think those comparisons would be fascinating to pursue. And yes, that application, I mean, I, one, of the, one of the keys, I think, uh, uh, of this comparative framework is to be attentive to the differences within these kind of monoliths. So in the United States, too often we treat Latin America as monolithic, uh, as one case that is to be explained. And it's so important to break it down and understand regional differences. And I think you, you do a really nice job here of breaking down uh, uh, the Brazilian monolith as well. Uh, so uh, really fascinating. Appreciate that very much. Uh, Gustavo and Oliveira Lima. Uh, uh, what another another fascinating figure. I've had this copy of the the evolution of Brazil uh, in kind of my po reading pile for a long time. Uh, somebody gave it to me as a you know, somebody who was engaged in this project of comparative history that I should know. Uh, and I, I, I'm ashamed to say I have not yet invested the time that I should have in reading it, but your talk will give me another push in that direction. Uh, you know, one thing I think is fascinating here is, um, you know, Oliver Lima, obviously a figure from a different period, uh, in a period in which throughout the Americas, there is this attempt to kind of rethink the relation between the Americas and Europe. Uh, and the Americas and the other Americas, as, as Jose Marti puts it. Uh, and there's a choice that gets made in this period, whether, uh, and I'm speaking the period of the early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, whether to uh, uh, recognize or contest this European claim to be the center of civilization, uh, and therefore to, to, cre to treat uh, Latin American civilization or American civilization more broadly to the extent that it exists as being a result of some connection to Europe or instead to insist upon the Americas as a uh, autonomous font of some kind of civilization. So you had within these independence movements, this strong claim made on behalf of the Americas against Europe. 
as being the source of new institutional ideas, eventually new artistic and scientific ideas. Uh, 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 and then, uh, you know, in the, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, this is what's being worked out. So you have a difference between a figure like Jose Marti, who wants to reject UN, United States as the only font of civilization in the Americas, uh, and, and invents this concept of Nuestra America as a counterpoint, uh, and thus remains firmly within this kind of new world versus old world and taking sides with the new world. Uh, but you have other figures, uh, 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 Rodo, the Uruguayan literary figure, uh, 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 who uh, is again, again, rejects, the, rejects North America, but in favor of a new, renewed connection to Europe for Latin America. Uh, and, and I think it would be interesting to think through Oliveira Lima in relation to some of those figures as well uh, and what the claims he's making are. Beyond that, these, his diplomatic career and career in international law sounds really fascinating and worth more uh, study. So um, thank you so much for these e excellent talks, given me so much to think about and read about and hope to continue the conversation in the future uh, uh, with you both. So, thank you once more. Uh, Gustavo, should I, should I do the, the, moderator, the moderation? Yeah, if you're free, I mean, you, you, are, you are in charge of that. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. Okay. For the moment, we have uh, only one subscription, but uh, it's, a, it's a heavy one. It's from Professor Martonio, uh, the professor of the Universidade de Fortaleza, also located in Fortaleza. So, Professor, you can use your microphone. You have the word. So thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, Philip? Can you hear me, all of you? Yes. So thank you very much. And I am very happy to listen all the conference today. And I wish we had time to make some questions or to make statements to all of them, because all of them were very interesting. But I would, I would, uh, I would like to outline one point of what, uh, from the words from Professor Simon, and uh, namely, uh, to ask you if, uh, please forgive me if I did not understand you correctly, but I completely agree uh, with your vision about this ambiguity with anti-imperialism and imperialism during the words, uh, during the, not only words, but the actions and the political movements of, of the Latin American, not only Creole, but all of them. But if I, uh, if I understood you correctly, I will ask you, uh, do you say that this ambiguity remains even, uh, for example, uh, during Cold War times and after Cold War times? Do you think that these intellectual points and these intellectual and political words, uh, do they still remain nowadays? Is that right, if I understood you? Uh yeah, yes, I think there are, I mean, they don't remain unchanged, uh, but there are, I think it, that anti-imperial imperialism remains a fruitful way of thinking through some of the ideologies that are offered in defense of, in particular, foreign policies uh, uh, of the United States, but not only the United States. Uh, in fact, this term anti-imperial imperialism uh, I have uh, adopted, borrowed uh, from a diplomatic historian, uh, uh, William Appleman Williams, uh, who himself focused on the Cold War period uh, and the late and the early 20th century uh, at, uh, as the period in which he thought this kind of uh, 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 this historical framework helped to explain what was taking place in the in the Cold War. So you see in the Cold War, in the foreign policy discourse of the United States in particular, uh, uh, idea of the new idea is of modernization. Uh, uh, so you see interventions waged on behalf of modernization. But why should these cases, why should we uh, seek the modernization of other places in the world, in particular of Latin America? Well, they need to be modernized in order to be defended against this external influence, which now is not the monarchies of Europe, but is the socialist uh, nations of uh, the Soviet bloc, yes? Yeah? So we need to modernize these nations of Central America uh, in order to insulate them against this external threat, which is communism, uh, which is uh, uh, 
uh, being uh, pulled into the Soviet orbit and the Soviet sphere of influence as opposed to the United States. So it's this imperial anti anti imperialism, right? So we will forcefully uh, intervene in order to prevent the conquest of these nations by this foreign ideology of communism. Uh, uh, so that's the that'd be the sort of crispest iteration of anti-imperial imperialism in the context of the Cold War in the United States. Uh, uh, but, you know, I think you can, I think there are arguments to be made that you see contemporary versions of this take place in uh, Latin America as well. Uh, uh, so uh, attempts uh, to uh, create uh, uh, solidarities, international solidarities against external threat, again, uh, and at times, at times to use uh, kind of levers of influence in order to enforce those international solidarities. Uh, this is present in Latin American actions in the Cold War, but I think we can see it. You know, one of the figures I had put up on that last slide of mine is uh, Hugo Chavez uh, and Hugo Chavez's conduct of foreign policy from Venezuela. So attempt to use uh, Venezuelan oil resources as a kind of lever to enforce a, a kind of anti uh, 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 imperial, as he understood it, uh, 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 solidarity within Latin America, right, to establish a kind of, I mean, in explicit terms, in some of his efforts to, uh, in the, with the ALBA and so on, uh, to create a uh, uh, international organization which would be able to better resist the influence of the United States in the region. Uh, so these are these contemporary uh, uh, iterations, I would call them, of this uh, anti-imperial imperialism that emerges in the independence movement. They're not obviously uh, uh, direct uh, uh, imitations. They are iterations. They are changed given circumstances. Uh, but the, the analogies are there, and I think it's helpful to understand their historical origins. Uh, I mean, obviously, in the case of Hugo Chavez, he invokes Bolivar as the inspiration for his own project, uh, 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 which in a sense... Uh, it, signals this historical legacy that I'm pointing on, but also invites us to kind of ask what are the differences between the project of Hugo Chavez and Simón Bolívar. Uh, uh, but so, yes, I, I, don't, I think there are uh, strong contemporary analogies to uh, the historical ideologies that I'm discussing. Thank you for the question. So uh, we have another question. It was made in by the chat, so I will just read it. It was made by Edilson Santana. The question it was directed to Professor Simon uh, and goes as follows. There is any relation between French revolutions ideas and the Creole revolutions? The French yeah. revolution ideas influence, influence Creole revolution? It was, uh, put it again. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a great question. Uh, and the French Revolution, the influence of the French Revolution in the Spanish American independence movements is profound and complex and contradictory. Again, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, some figures in the in Spanish America inspired by the French uh, uh, example. Uh, uh, and uh, some modes of dress at times, you know, these kind of tricolor rosettes and so on that would be worn. Uh, but in another way, in a lot of cases, the French uh, Revolution serves, like the Haitian Revolution that you mentioned, Felipe, uh, as a example of what needs to be avoided in Spanish America. And uh, uh, in the case of how can we possibly avoid the devolution into chaos and assassination and sham trials uh, 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 that the French experienced having uh, conducted their revolution. So for uh, uh, Lucas Aleman in particular, who is a reader of Edmund Burke uh, and who adopted uh, much of Edmund Burke's uh, critique uh, of the French Revolution uh, uh, and applied it to the Mexican case, this was a profoundly important way to think through what Mexico should do as it charted a path toward independence. Uh, uh, so uh, French Revolution, uh, in, very important. On the other hand, there were some direct kind of imports from the French Revolution. So you have uh, for example, uh, the Code Napoleon uh, uh, becomes incredibly influential in the legal codes that are adopted in Latin America after independence. Uh, uh, and, more gen and more kind of abstractly, legal codification as an aim uh, becomes a huge uh, 
uh, project in in the, both Americas uh, after independence. So just the idea that uh, a transition from a kind of customary legal system uh, 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 to a, a, a precisely codified positivist system is a project throughout the Americas, which is inspired in large part by the French case. So, uh, as I said, a complicated, uh, 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 contradictory, ambiguous uh, influence scene there. Yeah, um, thank you once again. And we have now Gustavo Cabral would like to make a question. Uh, I, I, I was wondering if is there anyone else who, who wants to to uh, I mean I, ha I have a, I have some questions I mean it's not one it, it, I have some questions and some remarks but yeah I, I, I have them as well <laughs> well so uh, I, I'm gonna do that I mean uh, the the two other uh, talks were terrific I mean uh, they made me think and reflect on on many things. Uh, uh, Philip knows, uh, uh, probably uh, Joshua uh, doesn't know, but I'm, I'm a specialist on, uh, on a previous period. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a legal historian uh, that works more with, um, with early modern age. So, I mean, I, I'm more, I'm more, in, I'm more uh, aware, let's say, uh, about uh, the, the, the colonial experience. And it's particularly about that, uh, my, my, uh, my remarks are, are on that. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's impressive the role, for example, of the uh, audiencias, so the administration of justice in, in the shaping of, 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 the, of, the, of the map, of, of Spanish-American map after the, the independence process. Uh, and then, uh, and, and then looking to the audience, to the audience, audiences, uh, we see the participation uh, of, of of this Creole elite uh, over there. I mean, uh, there are many cases of 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 people born in Spanish America that acted as judges. I mean, uh, corregidores and and so on. Uh, and even in the uh, ecclesiastical institutions, I mean, there are many, many uh, um, uh, arzobispos, uh, uh, arzobispos. Uh, sorry, I'm forgetting in English. I mean, I mean, the, 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 the you understand? Archbishop. You, you, archbishops. Uh, uh, archbishops. So, yes, thank you. Archbishops uh, that uh, were born in, in America uh, since. Uh, since the, the, the early 16th century, I mean, uh, it's, it, it was common. And then I, I, I always uh, uh, thought about, uh, uh, about the, the, the complaints, I mean, the, the claims uh, of this Creole elite. I mean, they, they were part of the administration. I mean, they, they were not uh, uh, viceroys. Uh, I mean, I, I, I know none that uh, nobody came to my mind. Uh, uh, if if I think on on I think about viceroys uh, in Spanish America, viceroys didn't didn't uh, 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 born there in, in in Spanish America. But I mean, they 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 had power, they had economic power, social uh, uh, prestige. They uh, many of them were professors uh, in Mexico, in in Peru. But many of them were uh, archbishops. But what did they want? I mean, uh, uh, th th that's a question. Uh, 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 what do you think about uh, about it? Uh, 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 it's only uh, about having more power, achieving more power. The power of 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 not being subordinated to. Uh, 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 I, I I think that if 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 the the, the answer uh, to this question is yes, I mean it's 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 something that it's a particular part. Uh, Particularly connected to 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 the to this moment. I mean, uh, the, this uh, moment of revolution. I mean, do not be uh, uh, subordinated to 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 to, uh, to 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 an authority that uh, had nothing to do with the uh, with this uh, perspective that people of the place must uh, uh, take part. In the determination of who will be the go uh, uh, who, who will uh, the governor who who we have this this power political power um, mm -hmm. and what about and then in, in that sense there is a there is a, a discussion uh, that Philippi uh, fa faced here uh, about the use of the, the word criollo uh, at, at, at criollo he, he, here in, in Brazil I mean. Uh, Oliveira Lima, for example, 
uh, in his book and in, in, in this in this fascinating book on the evolution of uh, he he uh, including uh, uh, remarked that in Portuguese America there are many people that uh, uh, despite uh, their origins in Portuguese in in, in America uh, uh, had important roles. In the in, in the metropole, I mean, there are, there are not a lot uh, people in this situation, but there are some. Uh, what what simply didn't happen in, in Spanish America, but the use of Creole, uh, 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 this 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 word here, uh, uh, it, it's. I mean, it's. It, I, I have some. I mean, I, I'd like to have some time to to, <laughs> to 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 explain more of my points, but I, I'm I'm not that comfortable. Uh, uh, with the use of of, of Creole here in, in Brazil uh, in, in these situations. I mean, I, I could talk a little bit more someday. But I have only one other remark about the, the political tendencies uh, in, in this, in the creation of, of this revolution. I mean, and the, in particularly in the, in the following decades after the, the independence process, uh, many of these I think most of them, probably all of them, all of the, the, the Latin American countries faced civil wars and civil wars between um, liberal and conservatives. I mean, in many cases, uh, with, a, with a lack of geology, it's, it's, in many times were just fa uh, 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 I mean, dis a power dispute. But what do you think about the role of these uh, different uh, ideologies in the making of 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 your Creole uh, ideology. What was the what, what, uh, what was the role of 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 liberalism and conservatism, and radicalism in, in in the shaping of of this um, um, big category? Let's, if I may so, uh, Creole. Uh, revolution of the ideology of Creole revolution, uh, and I mean it's, it's just that. I mean I have many more, but it's, thank you. It's it's, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, as you note, the Creoles participated in self-government throughout the Americas. Uh, you mentioned the audiencias, le cor the corregidores, the church hierarchy. Uh, uh, they were holders of a lot of cultural capital, often had ex excellent education, uh, uh, whether in Europe or in the Americas. Uh, they were major property owners. Uh, they had uh, uh, a privileged position within these economies, uh, did privileged forms of labor, not all, but most, uh, but many. Uh, 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 so what did they want? Uh, well, I think, you know, again, this is something we can see with some contemporary analogies. There's kind of nobody that gets so exercised about threats to uh, uh, their situation as the people who are the most privileged with any given, within any given situation, right? Uh, uh, so what did they want? In a sense, what they wanted was to maintain that those advantages against what they perceive to be really important threats to the position that they occupied within these societies. Uh, and those threats were emerging from these reforms to the uh, imperial administrative systems that were undertaken in the course of the 18th century. Uh, uh, so they, the British empire that is overthrown uh, is an empire that is attempting to uh, exert more direct control over its North American colonies by the end of the 18th century, in part because it has it is now fought uh, in extraordinarily expensive war in order to maintain its control of those colonies uh, against a coalition of, of European rivals. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, so there was some indigenous participation in that conflict as well. So Britain fights this extraordinarily uh, expensive war and now it wants to essentially make the colonies pay for that war. But they not only want to make the colonies pay for that war in the form of taxation, better oversight of taxation, so much more administration to avoid tax evasion. And since most taxation is taking place in the form of tariffs and uh, uh, taxes on exports, that means a very heavy administrative presence is installed in British North America uh, in order to oversee that process. Uh, uh, they also want to remove the sources of conflict of war and the sources of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, of conflict in the Americas. So they want to strictly control the advance of British North American colonists upon uncolonized frontiers of that of those colonies. Right. So they had gotten they had gotten involved in this war in, with France and with some indigenous populations in the Americas, in part because these British colonists were continuously creeping over the line of settlement, establishing new settlements, sparking off conflicts. And those conflicts are very expensive to resolve. Uh, <clears throat> so the British also want to install new controls upon the British colonists in North America, uh, prevent them from taking new land. Uh, uh, and those controls are experienced as a profound threat to the future of the colonies in North America. Uh, uh, Without the ability to continuously advance on this frontier of settlement, uh, the 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 position of Creoles within this empire is profoundly changed, according to them. Right. So, uh, uh, so this is a revolution fought in in no small part in order to to retain privileges which are enjoyed and which are understood to be threatened. And there are now, I think, you can there are clear analogies there to these Spanish American cases. Uh, Spain had also there there's a uh, uh, of course, a war concerning the succession uh, to the throne uh, uh, very early in the uh, 18th century, uh, a new uh, royal family uh, is seeking some sort of modernizing reforms over the course of the 18th century, the Bourbon reforms, uh, it, which in some ways open up new avenues for trade uh, within the Americas, but in other ways uh, institute new administrative controls on trade within the Americas. And these are... Uh, uh, understood to have generated some uh, resentments. Uh, uh, but then even more profoundly in this crisis, which results from Napoleon's intervention in the, uh, uh, in the uh, 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 succession uh, 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 in, uh, to the Spanish throne, uh, the installation of Joseph Bonaparte uh, and the uh, uh, liberal revolution essentially, which takes place in Spain uh, in, in, uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, again, Creoles are uncertain about the implications of that constitutional shift for their role within these American societies and defensive uh, uh, and eager to, to have a role in shaping the future uh, that they were not being accorded by even by these Spanish liberals either. So, uh, so what do they want? They want autonomy. They want autonomy as a means of preserving privileges, which they were accustomed to enjoy. Uh, uh, and they want to uh, to view themselves as as sort of uh, having come of age. You know that metaphor is so common in these in these discourses from this period that this is a kind of a branch of the tree which has come of age and is ready to stand on its own. I guess that metaphor doesn't really make sense at all, but it's commonly used. Uh, 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 the the colonies have come of age and are ready to stand on their own. The empires for a lot of these figures. Uh, they will look back on the empires and not denounce the experience of being ruled by Europe, uh, uh, but say that it was necessary in its time, and now that time has come to an end, right? It's no longer necessary. So uh, uh, the freedom to pursue a kind of progressive development, which was cultivated in a certain period by European rule and which now is, is being hampered by European rule. Uh, uh, so I think those are the... Those are the... Uh, uh, what they want. Uh, 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 the other question is interesting too. What are the differing ideologies within this overarching category of Creole ideology? Uh, uh, that's important. Uh, and as I was, as I tried to say in the talk, the argument is, of the book is not that these figures are identical in all respects, uh, or that. Uh, uh, they all said the exact same thing or that conservatism versus liberalism is not an important difference amongst Creole political thinkers. To the contrary, these are uh, uh, very important differences and the, the European intellectual traditions that inform them uh, 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 are a major part of the, the, the reconstruction of these ideas that I try to do in this book. Uh, uh, on the other hand, what I want to say is that Within the when you study ideologies, uh, study political discourse within these national boundaries, as we often do, when you look at the United States 
and you think the most important, what, what, what I really want to understand here is federalist, anti-federalist conflict, uh, uh, Hamilton Jefferson conflict. Uh, or when you look at, <clears throat> when you look at Mexico, you want to understand the conservative liberal conflict. Uh, uh, what, I think in times when we limit ourselves to national boundaries and ask what the distinctions are within those boundaries, we, we lose sight of the kind of larger contours that we get when we compare across cases. And when, we appear, when you compare across these cases, you can see that uh, uh, those, those differences of, of ideologies actually reflect, there are, there, are, there, are, there are overlapping points which constitute this ideology of Creole revolution, uh, having to do with what are the stakes of this conflict and what are the difficulties that are likely to arise in it. So you see, in each of these cases, partisan conflicts open up after independence. Uh, uh, strong ideological differences express themselves in uh, political conflict and oftentimes uh, in civil war. Uh, 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 but many of these divisions that are opening up are divisions about means to a common end. How can we achieve this common end that we actually share, which is retaining independence from the empires and limiting uh, the threat of domestic insurgency, uh, uh, which all of these cases are experiencing. And there are differences of opinion concerning what means are most conducive to that end. But for the most part, these figures share a vision of what that end actually is uh, over the course of the 19th century. So uh, without trying to argue at all that there are no important ideological differences in, in these factions, not, without trying to argue at all that there are no factions within the Creole class, I think by zooming out a little bit and taking that uh, uh, class and trying to identify the ideologies associated with it, we, we do learn something as well. Um, thank you. Uh, I would like to make a contribution in this discussion. Uh, I believe that the, the sociological, the re relation, re relational sociological approach of Boudier has again something to say about that. Yeah. I believe that those groups uh, want, uh, above all, to avoid declassification. Yeah? Right, right. The, 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 I mean, uh, a downfall in his uh, political status, social status. I believe in somehow, like, if you see the evolution of the Frey Kanekas writing between 1822, 18, 1824, 18, he was trying at all costs uh, to uh, retain a position. It could be through a monarchical, monarchical constitution. It could be, if, if it is a, Republica, a Republican, better. But it could be another form of government. But I have to retain the lo local autonomy that I, that I receive. And Pernambuco was suffering from a, a, a political downfall since 1808. When, the, when we have the migration of the royal family to Rio de Janeiro. Because it was better to have the metropolis uh, across sites, across uh, an ocean, than uh, located uh, 2,000 miles. Well, no, miles are less. I'm sorry. <laughs> 2,600 kilometers from, from them. I believe um, we could say that. And uh, since we have no more inscriptions, I would like also to make two simple, really easy questions to Joshua. <laughs> like the first one is that I would like to push my argument. I, I would like to know what, you, what do you think about that? The, at the end of the, my presentation, I was talking about slavery. And I know that you're exploring also some racial relations uh, in, in post-colonial period. So I would like to force, to push my argument to investigate about it, that uh, comparing uh, Brazilian and uh, United States uh, context, that somehow uh, our solution, and I'm not arguing about uh, economic development, it, it is clear which one was like better or most, most su successful. But I'm saying that in terms of racial uh, control, control of the population, we managed to develop a better solution, uh, somehow better, that avoid the secession war, for example. I mean, it is not that there was no violence, but one, one can say we have like micro violence in different regions that were controlled. There were nothing like a, a civil war. Uh, 
So maybe because of that, it's, it's one simple question. <laughs> and the other one, uh, it's like a me methodological one that I believe that it is something that are somehow um, hidden or in our approaches that uh, is the problem of how do you avoid uh, ending up in, in a in a economics um, in a reductionism economics view explain yeah. all the facts by the the economic reproduction on it i'm asking because uh, evaldo cabral de mello the author that i quoted is one of my main guides into uh, pernambuco historian and he's not uh, He's not a, Maxi, a Marxian historian, uh, historian, but it is plain clear how he explained like uh, the migration of the family, the taxes that Rio de Janeiro uh, puts on Pernambuco, the contracts made, the treats made by uh, Portuguese and, and Great Britain that uh, avoided or put some obstacles in the trade for those regions i i mean i think you got the question like how to avoid this kind of perspective sure great thank you um yeah the case of brazil is so interesting um so i i told i mentioned that i had written a little article on how the collapse of unions after independence may have affected the economic development of the different parts of the americas and explain the economic development gap help to explain the economic development gap uh uh and uh you know the literature that i'm arguing against there uh is this uh it's called the new institutional economic history uh, uh which argues that you kind of have these institutional uh, differences installed in the Americas during the colonial period, uh, uh, and that the being colonized by Britain or Spain or Portugal, uh, or or some people say rather than country of origin, it's kind of the context that is found on the ground and the forms of colonial institutions that are established as a result. Uh, those, in the, according to this literature, those institutional differences established during colonial rule directly explain differential developmental outcomes which are visible in the 20th century. Uh, and my, my intervention was to say that, well, that the influence of these colonial institutions is mediated by the process of independence. So that we have to realize that in the process of independence uh, 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 created institutional reforms so that the, the institutions that drove economic development in the Americas are not the institutions installed during colonial rule, but they, those institutions as they have been reformed or not reformed by uh, the institutions of these, in, uh, these independent governments. Um, and I try to show that institutional reform was on the agenda of all of these, of all of these independence movements, the leaders of these independence movements, uh, and they all that many of them understood these federal unions that we're creating as institutions as as instruments for institutional reform so that we are going to use the power of this federal government to reform the institutions that we have inherited from Britain or from Spain in order to create more conducive circumstances for for for, for uh, economic uh, development uh, and beyond that these federal unions were meant to serve as as uh, uh, instruments for economic development in and of themselves because they would facilitate exchange across territory uh, between complementary economies and so on. Uh, uh, now, that account that I give then works fairly well for USA versus Spanish America. We see the success of the federal union in the north, the failure in the south, and consequently faster economic development industrialization in the north and slower economic development industrialization in the south. But what about that case of Brazil, that big purple blob uh, on my maps there? Yes, uh, 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 it, it's a big problem. Uh, it was a big problem raised by reviewers when I first submitted that article, and I had to kind of scramble to try to provide an account uh, uh, of what, how I can explain the Brazilian case. Uh, and here's what I come up with. You tell me whether it makes sense to you. Uh, uh, the process, and you've gotten into some of this in your, both of you, in your talks, uh, 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 you had, uh, what I would say, 
I mean, one way to say what happened is that it's the most successful Creole revolution. Another way to understand it is it was kind of a, a Creole revolution that got cut off. Uh, uh, so you had uh, Bonifacio, uh, 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 Jose Bonifacio, uh, but he is influential and then loses influence. He uh, uh, is unable to carry through his plans uh, uh, because of the intervention of the monarchy. Uh, and the ma and the the uh, the deal that is struck between the monarchy and the slave owning uh, uh, agricultural elites of, of of southern Brazil in this period, right? Uh, uh, and the and part of the deal that is struck is that Brazil will remain unified; uh, it will not break down into parts. Uh, but as a result, we will not engage in institutional reforms of the kind that. Uh, Bonifacio was calling for and others were calling for. So what you had is unity without institutional reform uh, uh, and unity without, in particular, uh, uh, the kind of positive government intervention in the economy that you eventually did see in the United States. So uh, the, the crucial statistic that I cite at the end of my paper, which I think is fairly telling, is that uh, 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 in 1900, uh, the United States and Brazil have roughly the same land mass, uh, but the United States has 20 times as many miles of railroad built uh, uh, as compared with Brazil, right? Uh, uh, and this is a this is in large part in part it is due to the uh, 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 incentives being offered by the United States government by the federal government uh, and the institutional structure that allows. Uh, that the federal government facilitated to build these railroads across state boundaries and so on, right? Uh, uh, so you have Brazil as a case of retains unity, but doesn't build the infrastructure necessary to actually take advantage of that uh, unity uh, for economic development. Uh, 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 and that's how I account for uh, Brazil being a case of late, not not as late as some parts of Spanish America, uh, later industrialization uh, uh, than uh, the United States. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a, I think it's a fairly weak, as I said, it was a kind of uh, patching up problems in my argument way of dealing with Brazil, but, uh, and one that I should, uh, would, would like to learn more about and find out how convincing that is as an account. Um, oh, you also asked about yeah, slavery and the abolition of slavery uh, and and the different paths taken in Brazil and the United States uh, on that issue. I mean, I think, yeah, there are it's it's interesting that there was not a civil war about uh, preservation of slavery in, in Brazil. Uh, uh, and I think it's interesting the different. Uh, essentially civil rights movements uh, of the 20th century in Brazil and the United States. I mean, that's a fruitful line of comparison uh, that others have developed uh, that I haven't done enough work on to really comment on uh, uh, to say which uh, this kind of in the United States where this where there's the the exclusions of non-white uh, citizens of the United States were so explicit that they invite this highly conflictual civil rights movement uh, and maybe win recognition of the problem of racial discrimination uh, uh, in a way that in Brazil, the kind of uh, less explicit racial exclusions uh, uh, delay that civil rights movement, lead to a different ideology of the civil rights movement. I, I, I think it's interesting, but I don't, I don't think I know enough about it to, to, to really make the comparison convincing. Um, the issue of determinism. Uh, and economic determinism in particular. I think I'm able to get off the hook of economic determinism. Many of the institutions that I talk about structuring these class divisions are non-economic divisions, legal divisions, administrative divisions. Uh, but I think there is an element in, in some ways an unsettling, uncomfortable element of determinism still in the, even in the project of explaining ideas. You know, oftentimes you'll talk, if you talk to intellectual historians, philosophers, uh, you say, I'm a political scientist, I'm interested in sort of giving an explanation of the ideas of this period. They say, what do you mean an explanation? Do you mean whether or not they're good ideas or bad ideas? Or you mean whether or not 
this is a this is a what the United States independence movement was influenced or was not influenced by John Locke, that's an explanation. Now I say, no, I want an explanation that kind of how these ideas are tied to the interests of the thinkers uh, uh, and so on. And for a lot of people, that's just a terrible idea because what were ideas are the products of these unique individuals with unique biographies and unique geniuses and they uh, just come from nowhere, right? Uh, uh, so I think determinism is a problem anytime you want to explain ideas. Uh, 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 and one, you have to just kind of work. I think the key is always working back and forth. The way you avoid is you work back and forth from you develop your kind of determinist theory of the origins of the uh, that explains these ideas. Uh, uh, and then you say, well, look at all these departures from your theory. Uh, uh, and you give more particular biographical accounts of why those departures take place. And then you try to work them back into your theory and make your theory more complex. Uh, uh, so it's still determinist, but it's more complexly determinist. There are more factors so that it is not a product of, it's not reductionist if it's still determinist. Uh, 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 so that's the, that's the key, I think, working back from theory to cases and cases to theory. Uh, uh, um, but in the end, you know, you have to kind of have a argument and uh, and uh, whether you're a determinist or you think ideas are just these ephemeral products of individual geniuses. Uh, I've come down on this determinist. I think it's I think it's useful to think about ideas in this way. I think it's useful not only as a historical matter, but as a critical matter. Uh, we're better able to engage with those ideas if we refuse to just regard them as the emanations of some historical genius, uh, 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 if we understand them to be representative of some class interest. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, again, I don't think it's a problem that one can completely avoid, but it is a way, there are ways to kind of manage it. Okay, thank you. I actually ask, ask because I would like to hear, you, hear from you, but uh, let me just say that I believe that you have more friends in Brazilian universities that think I like you, that, that would oh, like to nice reconstruct to the ideas, the ideas through the, the economic and political context, I believe. Okay. Uh, Good, I hope to about, meet more of those friends. <laughs> yeah, about your answer, I actually think is a pretty uh, that decent explanation. It's, it's, it's what I am exploring right now. I know I have to deep study, uh, to deepen, uh, to do some more studies and explorations about that. But I know I wouldn't, uh, I know I couldn't say like that, but like a metaphor for we to understand what I think is that we, we have the union. But it was led by Jefferson and not Hamilton. Ah, yeah. Mm. Something, something like that. So right. I mean, if the our so that that's what what I meant when I said it was successful, because right. Right. Uh, what we're trying to maintain was internal order and not economic development. So if right. you understand right. success like this, so we like we were the best. <laughs> Like, uh, it was, I mean, it took time. It was not without violence, as I said, uh, but it was, it, it, it didn't engage, like, in a na national war. That's what I, what I would like to say. But, yeah, I, I, do, I do believe you, you I mean, uh, I can't say right, but, I mean, it's a, a nice hypothesis. I, I, I will further investigate that, I believe. Good. Well, I look forward to, to yeah. the, seeing the results of those investigations. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, Gustavo, you want to say? I think, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I don't know if, if anyone else has any, any questions. If, if, we, if, we, if nobody has, I'd like to thank everybody who was here for two hours and a half. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, without the audience, this uh, 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 excellent uh, seminar would not happen. And thank you very much for for being here, uh, 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 our uh, students, uh, master candidates, PhD candidates. Uh, I'd like also to mention the the professors that were here, uh, Professor Rafael Cabral, who, who is the the, the, the coordinator, the head of, of the Graduate Studies Program in Law, uh, 
of the Federal University of Semiárido, uh, FESA, um, Professor Luis Felipe Seixas, who is also here, uh, uh, also uh, uh, from the uh, FESA, Professor uh, Emanuel Furtado, filho, who is, who is, sti who is still here, uh, uh, my colleague here at, at the Federal University of Ceará, and Professor Matoni Montalverni. I, I think I, 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 I didn't forget. Uh, I mean, I, 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 yeah. Since, you, since, since you're starting doing that, I would like also to recognize, uh, acknowledge the presence of Raul Nibio professor at Federal de Uberlândia, and Tayara Lemos, that professor of Universidade Federal Juiz de Fora, Campus Governador Valadares. And, and I believe... Pablo here. Pablo's also here. Yeah, 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 Pablo, that's true. And uh, it's, uh, that's, uh, that's always dangerous. You should... Uh, uh, <laughs> only thanks for our colleagues. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, thank, thank you very much, uh, you all. Uh, I, I, I once would like to, uh, to, 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 to say only a word. I received a, a message right here uh, and, and a, a friend of mine that was here and he, he, was, he was saying that he, I, I should not, uh, 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 I mean, say uh, uh, words in support of the monarchy. I, 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 I mean, I, I said, I'm a Republican. I mean, <laughs> Oliveira Lima was a monarchist, <laughs> and not me. <laughs> I'd like to to understand that. So thank you very much, Joshua. It was a, a pleasure to us to to hear you, and to and and to be part uh, be part of of this uh, incredible uh, debate. And I hope we, we have other opportunities in the near future if this pandemic situation let us do so. Uh, but even if this terrible situation uh, remains, uh, it, there is internet, and internet put people together, even uh, with thousands of kilometers of distance. Thank you very much. No, thank you. It was really a pleasure. Uh, yes, and I hope next time in Brazil. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. I would like, uh, before uh, we give the word to Joshua to say his final words, I would like also to say that a friend texts me as well, saying to if if simon if joshua simon wants to have a little chat with jose bonifacio he could do he could do it at bryant park new york since his mm. statue it's there i mean oh, really? my friend right. told my friend told me it is in the back of the library uh, i never oh. been there so i actually don't know but apparently he lived he lived he lived his uh last years there so i don't know oh, never right. been there uh, well, that, that's great. That's uh, another point of uh, convergence, this kind of experience of exile uh, at the end of one's life and having a statue in, in New York, which many of these, there are more, more Creole revolutionaries than you would uh, expect to have statues in New York. Uh, but really, thank you so much to all of you. Thank you for the invitation, Felipe. Thank you, Gustavo, for your fascinating talk. Uh, 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 it was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, look forward to further exchange. Thank you so much. Goodbye.